Our video journey through Mexico will require a bit of effort on your part as well, if you really want to experience Mexico as we did. You see, there's just so much variety, so much history, so much to see, learn, and enjoy in this fascinating country. There are the famous ruins of Mexico's ancient pre-Columbian cultures, of course, but also Baroque reminders of Spanish colonial times. And don't forget Mexico's own Wild West. There are breathtaking landscapes and tropical rainforests, unique among Mexican seaside resorts. This enchanting port with its picturesque town center is one of the favorite resorts on the Pacific coast of Mexico. The coastline is dotted with beautiful villas and fine hotels. Tourism really started after John Huston shot Tennessee Williams' The Night of the Iguana here in 1964. The film starred Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, and Eva Gardner. That was enough to put the town in the spotlight. You won't get bored here either. Puerto Vallarta offers plenty. Whether you just want to loaf on the beach, take advantage of the numerous activities, or just watch. But here, the large Mexican families mix right in with the jet set. Bordered by rich green tropical vegetation, the coastal road leads past palm, banana, mango, and lemon groves. But don't forget that Mexico's Pacific coast is over 4,000 miles long. And that's plenty long enough not only to have modern seaside resorts, but also numerous little fishing villages and coves where tourism is practically unknown. If you just want to be alone with the ocean and your thoughts, well, it's right here waiting for you. We almost hesitate to mention the little fishing village of Chacala Bay, for we hope that this real breath of fresh air for all of us who accept and appreciate things as they naturally are will stay its charming self for a long time to come. The sand on the beaches is still white and fine. There's no sign of a house here. And the views of the ocean and the mountains are enough to put romantic thoughts into anyone's head. The scene somehow reminds one of Polynesia in the South Seas. Here one could spend unforgettable days, weeks, months, even years, forever.
The westernmost part of Mexico is the 800 mile long Baja California Peninsula. This is rough country. There are few towns, but plenty of long empty spaces, cactus deserts, mountains, and virgin beaches. At its southernmost tip lies the little fishing port of Cabo San Lucas, a deep sea fisherman's dream where he can hire boats with experienced skippers by the day. There are more than 600 different kinds of fish in these waters. And in the lagoon of Ojo de Liebre, from January to March, one can even stand right on the beach and watch the whale cops being born. For deep sea fishermen, the catch of a giant swordfish or tuna is almost a sure thing. The white rock cliffs of the southern tip are the landmark of Baja California. There, where the aquamarine Mar de Cortez meets the sapphire blue Pacific. The most exciting railroad trip in Mexico joins Los Mochis on the Pacific coast with Chihuahua. It goes through tunnels bored through rock, over track beds dynamited into sheer sides of mountains, and crosses dozens of bridges over rivers and valleys. Its 89 tunnels and 39 bridges are masterful feats of engineering. Construction was started in 1903 and only finished 60 years later. Gradually, the hot, humid coastal climate gives way to refreshing, clear mountain air as we snake our way through the wild, romantic landscape of the Sierra Madre Occidental to over 8,000 feet. This is railroading as it used to be. This area is also called the Sierra Tarahumara, since it's the reserve of the Tarahumara Indians. High point of the trip is the Barranca del Cobre, a series of canyons which could swallow up the Grand Canyon several times over. Dizzying drops are framed by rock arches formed by erosion over millions of years. The rock walls drop 6,500 feet straight down.
Originally, the Tarahumaras settled throughout the whole state of Chihuahua and also sometimes lived in caves. They hunted, fished, and generally lived off the land. As a result of attacks and bad treatment by the Spanish, the Indians resisted every attempt to assimilate them, preferring the freedom of isolation. In spite of a rather poor diet, they are surprisingly hardy. The women sell tourists woven baskets, woodwork, woven materials, pottery, and other handicrafts. The Indians live a semi-nomadic life in the summer, in the higher regions where they farm, raise animals, and grow fruit. They are also involved in handling with wood. In winter, they migrate to the warm tropical valleys. After the Indians had withdrawn from the Spanish area to the out-of-the-way Sierra Madre, Jesuit padres sought them out to try to convert them. But then, when gold and silver were discovered in the Sierra Madre at the end of the 17th century, Spanish soldiers and settlers came into the area. They often forced the Tarahumaras to work the mines and also misused their women. This finally caused the normally peaceful Indians to rise up against the oppressors and two wars were fought. Although they were finally defeated and they renounced armed conflict, the Indians still resisted any attempt of ever encroaching civilization to integrate them. And even today, they still cling to their natural lifestyle. They tend to be very reserved with strangers. The magnificent landscapes, the wide horizons and the crystal clear air of the state of Durango at the foot of the Sierra Madre have brought numerous film directors here to film their westerns. Many of the town sets they built can still be seen. Quite a few John Wayne films were shot here. In fact, this western town is unofficially called John Wayne City and he is still fondly remembered by many of the local citizens who appeared with him in his films. Yes, many well-known films were shot here, but which ones? Maybe you'll find out when you take a stroll through the town and it all comes back to life again. On February 20th, 1943, the earth on his cornfield suddenly started to open and a farmer witnessed the birth of the volcano Paricutin. One year later, the lava had already buried his local village and today, only the church steeple can still be seen sticking out of the cold lava fields of the now extinct volcano. In contrast, this geyser has been running continuously for 35 years, pumping out loads of energy for which no one has yet found a use. There are numerous geologically young volcanoes, some of them active, spread right across the landscape of Mexico from the Pacific coast to the Gulf Coast. South of Chapalilla, the road runs through the bizarre black lava fields of the volcano Ceboruco, which erupted last in 1870. From lava fields to agave fields, row after row of agave, as far as the eye can see. A strong alcoholic drink is made from the juice of these plants. It takes its name from a local town, tequila. Excuse the interruption, but suddenly we found ourselves right in the middle of a wedding party and just couldn't resist filming them. Who could? Back to tequila. The agave is a plant that accumulates water, like the cactus. 
In tequila, the distillation is still done according to traditional natural methods. But if you want to try all the different kinds, watch out. Another popular tradition that's alive and well is the charro, the Mexican rodeo. Sundays, one can see whole families dressed in their special and very expensive charro costumes on their way to the arena. Happily, like the rodeo, the chariada is a test of skills between man and beast rather than a bloody tragedy like the bullfight. It also shows the special partnership between the vaquero, the Mexican cowboy, and his horse. In fact, the horse enjoys a place of honor in almost all popular Mexican festivals. But here, the bulls don't do so badly either in contrast to the hopeless situation that confronts them in the corridor. The chariada is a sporting competition between man and beast, where either can win. It's also a chance for the horse and rider team to strut their stuff as well. In any case, it's only a game, and not a matter of life and death, even for the bulls, though the action might at times knock them off their feet. It's a festival. Music, beer, tequila, snacks, friends, and a chance to talk a bit too, let's not forget that. Bull riding is one of the most popular events, but this bull doesn't seem to have his heart in it today. On the other hand, some people can't wait to get started. Most riders belong to a club, and from early childhood, they learn to handle horses, and then work together to develop special team drills to show off at the festivals, like these girls. Here's another crowd pleaser, a real bucking bronco. Ride him, cowboy. When the day's top winner takes his bows, the whole audience has a chance to get into the act. They cheer and celebrate his victory by pelting him with hats, coats, shoes, and just about anything else they can get their hands on. The only problem is that the poor guy has to pick it all up and give it back, each and every piece. Makes you wonder about winning, doesn't it? 8,000 feet above sea level, among the volcano peaks, is one of the largest and most beautiful lakes in Mexico, Lake Pazcuaro. There are numerous Indian fishing villages on its shores and islands. In Mexico, there are only two seasons, dry or wet. But even during the wet season, from May to November, most of the rain arrives in the form of afternoon thunderstorms. Usually, that meant the end of our day's filming. But sometimes, as here with these young Mexicans, the fun was contagious. <laughs> Morelia, the capital of the state of Michoacan, has never lost its colonial flavor. Strolling through the small streets and alleyways, there's a lovely feeling of peace and calm, and happily, a marked absence of the usual city hustle and bustle. 
And if one gets tired of walking, there are numerous plazuelas where one can stop and relax. Morelia is also well known as a city where the arts are flourishing. It was named for its native son, Jose Maria Morelos, a hero of the Mexican Revolution. Following the street of the revolution again, we reach Guanajuato, formerly the richest of the Mexican silver cities. In 1810, it was captured by the revolutionary troops of Pate Hidalgo. But a year later, the royalist troops retook the city and, to strike fear into the hearts of the population, displayed Hidalgo's severed head and those of his three closest associates in the city. The numerous streets that run through tunnels must be enough to drive the city's mapmakers crazy. As the town developed, the abandoned mining tunnels through the mountains were put to good practical use as streets connecting the various parts of the city. Countless colonial buildings show Moorish influence, and the houses tend to have rich, pleasing colors. Sometimes, it seems almost as if a street ran out of breath and just stopped. But there are always steep stairs leading to the next one. Some alleyways are only a yard wide. Still, there are always tourists who are quite willing to show why this one is called Kiss Alley. The Mexican Central Highlands, with their deep valleys and high plateaus, have a tremendous variety of vegetation. The pulque agave, from which the alcoholic drink of the same name has been made since pre-Columbian times, is only one of 170 different species of agave. Together with wheat and barley, it is a crop that can be raised at altitudes above 8,000 feet. The rich soil and plenty of available water make for ideal farming conditions. This fertile volcanic soil has provided Mexico with wheat for ages, and today it's becoming increasingly the kitchen garden of such large populated centers as Guadalajara and Mexico City. But the most important crop for use in Mexico itself is corn. This type of cone-shaped white silo is in use throughout the countryside. San Miguel de Allende, which enjoys historical monument status, is the most picturesque of all the colonial cities. The charming character of the city and a famous art school have attracted artists and writers from North America since the 1940s. Today, they make up 10% of the population, and their influence on the social scene is quite obvious. Fate has made the city of Querétaro a memorial to Mexican history. In 1848, the treaty that ceded more than half of Mexico's northern territory to the United States was signed here. In 1867, Emperor Maximilian and his generals were shot here. And in 1917, the Mexican Constitution, still in force today, was proclaimed here. But now, in order to give you a good idea of the interesting archaeological sites, we'll have to start back with the pre-Columbian past again. In 850 AD, the Toltecs founded Tula. For 300 years, it was their capital and their religious center, until it was destroyed in 1168 with the downfall of the Chichineks. Only the columns of the Temple of the Morning Star on the 33-foot-high Quetzalcoatl Pyramid survived. These 15-foot-high anthropomorphic black stone columns are most striking. They are a sculptural expression of a warlike but also artistic people. After the collapse of their empire, the Toltecs started their 750-mile migration to Yucatan. Here in Tula, one can clearly see the beginnings of their cultural influence on the Mayas, and one remembers similar artwork in Chichen Itza. The temple city of Teotihuacan, with its 215-foot-high Pyramid of the Sun and 135-foot-high Pyramid of the Moon, is mysterious, strange, and impressive. Very little is known about the people who built it. The city was already in ruins when the Aztecs discovered it. 
Impressed by its superhuman dimensions, they called it the Place of the Gods. The reconstructed pyramids are not the archaeologist's chief interest here, but rather it is the numerous colorful frescoes on the surviving walls that were painted over 1,500 years ago by Indian artists. This temple facade with its green birds, shells with feathers, musical instruments and flowers is especially interesting. At its height, Teotihuacan had between 100,000 and 150,000 inhabitants. The religious center, laid out on a north-south axis, extends for over one and a quarter miles and is open to the countryside at the south. Only about one-seventh of the city's approximately 95 square mile area has been excavated to date. But these excavations discovered the Quetzalcoatl Temple. Four of the original six levels had impressive sculptures of rain god masks and plumed snake heads, which still partly showed their original colors. The Anthropological Museum in Mexico City, a high point of any visit to Mexico, has a very convincing reconstruction of the front of this pyramid on exhibit. While we're here at the museum, let's also have a look at some of the most important exhibits. This 24-ton Aztec calendar stone is particularly interesting. Around the central figure of the sun god, Tonatiu, with his tongue sticking out, are grouped hieroglyphics for the cosmic ages and signs for the months and days. In the same room are also stone figures of Coatlicue, Chochipis, god of love, poetry and dance, as well as the stone of the ruler Titzok, with the descriptions of his conquests carved in circular fashion around its surface. The Oaxaca room shows typical pottery in the form of gods. The style of this dynamic wrestler, the snake stone, and this group is particular to the Gulf Coast civilizations. The Mayan section is extremely attractive. That's also what the thieves thought, who on December 25, 1985, stole 64 of the 143 objects on exhibit. This copy of the Tlaloc Paradise with the souls of warriors and the drowned is a fine example of the temple wall painting of Teotihuacan. This unique statue of a warrior's head in a coyote's mouth is inlaid with mother of pearl. In the pre-classic room, one can again see clay figures, especially female fertility idols, as well as scenes from everyday life. This acrobat vase is a quite nice example. This special exhibit shows some of the articles from the 1985 robbery which have been recovered. The golden sun disk from Chichen Itza and the gold jewelry from grave number no. 7 in Monte Alban are especially prized. golden butterfly symbol and the pectoral from Yanchitlan are quite unique. Tenochtitlan was built by the Aztecs in the middle of Lake Texcoco on the place where a prophecy had said they would find an eagle on a cactus devouring a snake. Gradually, parts of the lake were drained off and by the time the Spanish arrived, the city had 50,000 inhabitants. Cortes and his soldiers were surprised and impressed when they saw Tenochtitlan for the first time. But then, with grim fury, they razed the city and leveled it to the ground. On the ruins, they built Mexico, the first Spanish city in the New World that was laid out checkerboard fashion with streets at right angles. The Spanish also leveled the Aztec religious center, and now the cathedral and the Zócalo are located there. 
The monumental dimensions and the continuity of style combine to make this square a prime example of Spanish colonial architecture. The Palacio Nacional, which Cortes had built from the ruins of Moctezuma's palace, also borders the Zocalo. 183 historic buildings are listed in the center of the city. The quarter, with its little squares and many pedestrian areas, makes a most charming impression. Strolling around the Alameda Park, one notices the church of San Hippolito. It has already sunk more than 13 feet into the soil as a result of the continued draining of Lake Texcoco over hundreds of years. Our camera and the bell are level, but the tower of the church of San Juan with its interesting shell arch facade isn't. Another victim. The Palacio de Bellas Artes, with its white Carrara marble Art Nouveau architecture, started to sink even as it was being built. Thanks to its floating foundation, the highest building in Mexico, over 565 feet, has neither sunk nor been damaged by earthquakes. The Beethoven Memorial is located at the eastern entrance to the Alameda Park. The park's foliage plays an important role in helping to purify the city's air. With its fountains, benches, statues, and little squares, it's a lovely place to stroll or just relax and enjoy a lazy siesta mexicana. The chief monument in the Alameda is the white marble columned semicircular Juarez Memorial on the southern side of the park. The statues on the balustrade behind Juarez symbolize fame and justice. The tombs of the four revolutionary presidents and also of Pancho Villa are in the four pillared monument to the revolution. It is 220 feet high. The 1200 acre Chapultepec Park plays an important role in supplying the city with fresh oxygen, and as well as numerous educational and recreational complexes, also contains the Castillo de Chapultepec, the residence of the viceroys, Emperor Maximilian, and the Mexican president. Tourists enjoy a panoramic view of the city from here, but this is also where Mexican families come weekends to leave city life behind and enjoy picnicking, jogging, games, or just being in love. Somehow, they seem to have a knack for getting the most out of even the simplest weekend pleasures. But we still have a bit to see. This boulevard, which Maximilian had built to connect the castle with the government buildings, was modeled on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. It's lined with statues relating to Mexico's history. Nowadays, the Angel of Freedom and the other monuments are surrounded by eight lane-wide traffic circles. The same is true of the monument of the last Aztec prince, Cuatemo, which pictures him proudly attired as a warrior. The Pasco de la Reforma, with its numerous monuments, supermodern buildings, parks, palms, boutiques, elaborate cinemas, and countless restaurants, is often called the backbone of the city. The Christopher Columbus monument was erected in 1877. At Columbus' feet sit four monks who played an important role in Mexico's history. The statue of Corregidora Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez, wife of the mayor of Querétaro, has stood in the center of Plaza Santo Domingo since 1900. She and her husband played deciding roles in the 1810 independence movement. Cuauhtémoc's palace also once stood here, and it was here that the Aztecs saw the promised eagle which caused them to found Tenochtitlan. The square exudes an aura of pleasant activity. Under the arcades, professional letter writers, like scribes of old, but with typewriters now, hammer out all kinds of letters for their illiterate client.
And there are also numerous small printers who will be happy to make a quick job of printing your business cards, wedding announcements, or whatever else you might need printed. The old Basilica of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe was being used as a museum until the earthquake of 1985. But now it is closed due to danger of collapse. The new Basilica was built next to it in 1976. It holds 20,000 people and is today the real symbol of the nation and the most important place of pilgrimage for the people of all Latin America. On December 9, 1531, the Virgin Mary appeared in the form of a brown-skinned Indian to the Indio Juan Diego. She appeared several times, but the church leaders were cautious and reluctant to recognize the apparitions. Thereupon, she caused roses to bloom in the middle of winter. Juan Diego picked them, wrapped them in his poncho, and took them to the bishop. When he took out the roses before the bishop, a portrait of the Virgin ringed with shining gold was found on his poncho. This portrait, now framed, hangs in the new basilica of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. In 1745, the Vatican recognized the visitations and named the Virgin as the patron saint of Mexico. These frescoes by the artist Siqueiros decorate the rector's building at the Universidad Autónoma Nacional de México. With 80 buildings on 865 acres, the university is practically a city in itself. It has justifiably been called a high point of modern Mexican architecture. Best known of the buildings is the 10-story central library with its mosaics by Juan O'Gorman, which show scenes from Mexican history and learning. Today, there are about 300,000 students enrolled at the university. It's interesting, and perhaps unique, that the university enjoys a special status and the police and the army are forbidden from entering its grounds. Well, our Mexican tour is just about over. But before we go, we'd like to show you a couple of experiences which we very much enjoyed. Chochimilco, in the southern part of Mexico City, is famous for its floating gardens and colorful boats. Actually, the gardens don't really float anymore, as they did when the Aztecs first built them on rectangular rafts in the 14th century. The rafts were anchored to the lake bottom by the roots of plants planted around their edges. Because the water level was so low, and also because the plants grew so well, the floating islands turned into very fertile real islands. Today, these islands produce up to seven harvests of flowers and vegetables each year. Cruising through the canals on the colorful covered boats is a very popular pastime. Such a ride through this Mexican Venice gives one a good idea of what the Aztec waterways must have been like. On some boats, floating peddlers hawk flowers, tortillas, drinks, and handicrafts. On others, the ever popular mariachi groups entertain with their typically Mexican music. Here on the Plaza Garibaldi and its surrounding streets, you might get the feeling that you've walked onto the set of one of those typical romantic Mexican films. All the props are there. Sombreros, classic mustaches, flashing dark eyes, shining black hair, silver spurs, the sound of guitars and wailing mariachi trumpets, and imploring singing that seems to sigh from the heart. We hope you've enjoyed this trip through Mexico and some of its history. There's so much to see and enjoy that speaking for ourselves, we can only say, we'll be back. Hasta luego. See you in Mexico. Besar tus labios quisiera, besar tus labios quisiera, malagueña salerosa, y decirte niña hermosa, eres
por pobre me desprecio, yo te concedo razón, yo te concedo razón, si por pobre me desprecio, yo no te ofrezco riqueza, te ofrezco mi corazón, te ofrezco mi corazón. 